Hello, my name is Eden Hennessy. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a social psychologist at Wilfrid Laurier University. Currently, I'm the manager of the Center for Student Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And it is my privilege to be here with you today to talk about our voices and how they are our power. So you might have noticed that I'm in the dark. Over the last few years, maybe you've felt in the dark too. Sometimes I've just felt so incredibly burnt out that I'm trying to light a spark and to make a flame, but I just can't muster the energy. Maybe you feel the same way, or maybe your spark is there, but it's, it's just burning as an ember. The past few years have been very difficult for us all. And throughout this experience, some of the most impacted people have been women, racialized women, indigenous women, women with disabilities. So it's important that we're all gathering here today to listen and learn from one another together. Let's try and find that spot. Let's try to light our path back to healing. The first artist who is coming to us today is Janice Jolie. Janice Jolie is a hard, femme, queer, radical, comedian, truth teller, and trickster who is known for being disarmingly hilarious and off the cuff. Janice uses art to build flourishing communities based in justice and joy. Welcome, Janice. The biggest lesson I learned and I think is what took me out of youth. Um, and for me, youth, leaving your youth is once your innocence has been shattered, like the naive way in which you saw the world with such like bright open eyes, a little bit clueless. Once you start to see like, ah, okay, these are the things that are actually realistic that I can achieve in terms of my dreams. So the biggest lesson I learned about that was that I could not be recklessly committed to KW. You know, and I loved KW. I wanted to live there. I wanted to live there and make it work. But I was not loved by KW in the same way that I loved KW. Nothing is KW is not like a, it's not a place. It's people, right? It's individuals that make up a community, that make up a home. And even all the white people I loved and who were friends with me, and because we were so bad, we were not ready to have difficult conversations about race. Um, it was hard to love white people when they were oppressing me, right? So I allowed myself to be harmed and exploited for so long by being, by staying. And I learned, the biggest lesson I learned that was about boundaries and learning to say no. That I had to care for my energy if I was going to survive and also thrive. And I learned that I was destroying myself by trying to force anti-racist conversations on people that were just not ready in a city that didn't yet have the infrastructure or the political will. This is circa 2010 to 2015, right? And so changing my phone number and like succession planning and training new people for all the, for like Rainbow Reels and Kitchener Wilder Poetry Slam, these organizations I was help running you know, succession planning and then extricating myself and kind of sneaking out of KW and changing my phone number was like this most heroic act I did of self-preservation and liberation. And I moved to Toronto. My play had been, um, take, was being premiered in Toronto at Passamari after it's running KW with Greenlight Arts. And I was blessed. And the universe like blessed me and gave me a gift, which was that uh, Lillian Allen decided that she was going to be my mentor. And Lillian Allen is, is like a godmother of spoken word and dub in Canada and is a poet, a playwright, an educator, and just an overall inspiring human being. And, you know, she, her confidence in me reminded me that I am strong and able, that I'm not always like burnt out and angry and hopeless 
And she reignited my motivation to serve the community that made me, right? I was challenged by Lillian to listen, be patient, and understand that big dreams and projects take a long time. And she reminds me how important it is to know our own history, to know where we come from, where our art forms come from, and the lineages that we are a part of, and the stories and people that led to us being, to being where we are now. And her mentorship really showed me how crucial intergenerational friendship is in a world where you know, we need to come together beyond all the divisions that we're creating. So it's incredible now to see how much energy I have when I'm not constantly giving it away. Um, I'm still internalizing that lesson that I should, shouldn't give away my spirit and my gifts to people who don't want them. You know, I'm still learning that when someone shows me who they are, I need to accept that. I need to believe them and not, you know, be angry when I meet someone who is not the way I want them to be. That person is still on a journey, you know? And the empty space and empty time that I have had over the past few years, and also now in this ongoing panorama, even more so, has given me the capacity to face myself and recover myself and heal. And the, my responsibility, I've realized, is to regulate what enters and exits my body, right? I'm trying to live a life where I can be my best self. As a full-time artist, I'm often questioning, you know, what does success look like for me? First of all, I'd like to be out of student debt, but, you know, that's a journey still. <laughs> I'm also, like, really not trying to pay it off very hard. But um, success for me is when what I offer is what I offer is valued. Success is when my artwork brings back to me the gifts of listening, support, friendship, and community. And I feel successful as an artist, as a professional, when I can make a living that minimizes the suffering, labor exploitation, and resource extraction that comes from living within a capitalist economic system. And for success for me is when my practice moves me and the people around me towards freedom from systemic oppression and self-suppression. I also feel that my art, you know, I put it out into the world and it's for my community. My audiences are my community and it, therefore it's subject to critique and criticism and feedback. And I do my best, but I'm also allowing room for error, allowing room for learning. You know, we can only learn when we make mistakes or when someone tells us like, oh, have you heard, do you know about this way, right? Ignorance can only be solved by new information, right? And I, but at the same time, I'm trying to be kind to myself when I do make mistakes and um, trying to be accountable for that and not be immobilized by shame and guilt, but just taking responsibility like, oh, I didn't know that now, and now I'm learning and that's great, you know? I want what I offer as a person to act as a spark or an opening to emotional truth, to like really being in touch with our emotions, social truth, untapped or forgotten joy, and self-power. And I want to create an open space which reminds us that human connection is actually full of beauty, wonder, and a life worth living, which is super hard right now in these times. But hopefully music and poetry and community and friendship can bring us back to what's really important in this life. Thank you so much, Laurier. That has been me, Janice Jolie. <laughs> Everybody, give a warm round of applause for the incredible Janice Jolie. And Janice, I feel you've, you've lit the spark. I can feel my world brightening. And I think that's really important. Some of the messages that you talked about, things like your body holding your whole life, things like not having boundaries, doing the work without filling up your own tank, right? Without relighting your own spark. She talked about finding a mentor, being reinvigorated, the value of intergenerational friendships, the importance of knowing lineage, and how amazing it is to see the energy we have when we don't carelessly give it away. Janice talked about taking responsibility for what goes in and out of our bodies, 
acting as the spark to move us collectively closer to freedom and justice. If we can find our passion, find our spark, and reunite the passion within us, we can be powerful agents of change, burning strong. The next performer exemplifies just that. Ksenia Williams is a member of the Wolf Clan of the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Ksenio is a Mohawk poet, sustainable builder, earthship dweller, indigenous consultant, curriculum developer, doula, and activist. Williams uses her poetry as a tool for social change and community engagement, aiming to educate non-indigenous people about the struggles, beauty, and realities facing indigenous people. Her work attempts to create moments of understanding, connection, and healing for indigenous people. going to do a poem um, I'm gonna do two poems for you guys and the first one is called cascade and so this poem um, I had actually written it before my experiences with Lambeck but it's really interesting because so many things that had happened and kind of the way that things played out were like very much directly um, came from that poem. And so like, I talk about um, like white men clapping proudly for other white men. And when I was arrested, the mayor of Haldeman um, actually put out a public statement applauding the OPP um, for my arrest and encouraged the OPP to continue to uh, target my family. For me, my voice like comes from my people and has always been about being able to process things and being able to use art as a way to um, create moments of healing for myself. And through the many, many years of doing this work and um, performing all over the place, what I've been able to see is that it's able to also bring healing to other people as well. And so, um, I'm just going to do the poem, and yeah, here it is. My body is in fear of white men as their ways cascade over me, pinning themselves against my skin. I am not free to move as I wish, to hunt, to build a home, to govern this body, 
to soak my children in love and culture because my whole world is immobilized. I can't seem to get them off my body. I can't seem to get them off my land. And so the white men clap proudly for other white men as they publicly conquer me push my face into the soil I so desperately want to protect. But then the earth grows angry, voices her concern with an early spring, a hailstorm, a tornado. She floods rivers and oceans because she is trying to speak to them. But the white men are not fluent in the language of consent, of survival, the white men are not fluent in the language of emotion, of earth, and so the whole country stands by and watches from their houses on stolen land, food in their bellies, pockets full of Indian money, and words like reconciliation spilling from their lips. So I'm going to do another piece for you guys, um, and it's called I Wish. My daughters, I wish I could love you without intergenerational trauma wrapped around my vocal cords, without sort of English in my mouth. I wish my words felt like honey instead of beans. I wish I could love you freely without emotional constraints that have been placed on me. I wish I could love you like this place never existed, as if our home was never invaded, as if our families were not systematically torn apart at the seams, open, broken, held together by the need to decolonize, to rise. I wish I could love you as if our sovereignty was respected without our treaties being neglected. Sometimes all I can think about is being able to love you without the weight of our land being stolen. And I want so badly to wrap my arms around you and melt into each other. Without fear of agents knocking on our door, I wish I had something more than this rage to give you. Let it be your protection. Let it be wood for your fire, tend it like gardens on sunny days. I wish this poem wasn't so heavy on my tongue. I wish I could hit rewind. Go back down to that house on the river and place your grandmother back into her mother's arms. I wish I knew stillness instead of chaos, dizziness. I wish I could hit rewind. Another one dead, hung by her neck. Another one OD'd, another child denied basic humanity, another one locked up, another unfair verdict. My girls, I hope another one is never you. I wish it was understood that another one was always the intended outcome of those schools. And as a people, we have a long way to go. My girls, I wish I could love you as if we were already there. And I will love you open, broken, mother you as if you are earth and moon, land and water, intentionally. My daughters, I will love you. Wow. Everyone, please join me in thanking Gesenia Williams for their contributions to this event, for sharing her voice and her power. Gesenia talked about fighting for autonomy, fighting for sovereignty, fighting for land. Gesenia talked about how words like reconciliation are meaningless unless they are accompanied with action and transformation. And over the last couple of years, what has become abundantly clear to us all is that we need a radical transformation. Systemic change is needed in order for all of us to be able to flourish as a society, as humanity. 
Ksenia talks about wanting to give her daughters more than just this rage. Let it be their protection. And rage is a strong message and motivator that provides us all with a flame to engage in action. And rage is linked to the next performance very strongly. Who This performer reminds us that we must feel intensely to be moved enough to take action against injustice. Sometimes we need to let it burn. Please join me in welcoming Joni Narita. <laughs> something in the water that keeps us cold and so resigned how can we claim to be successful with so many left behind self-serving interests get us nowhere when one is harmed it harms us all we need to put things into action we need to let this construct fall let it burn Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, rest in peace Jordan Edwards, Ianna Jones, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott, rest in peace Michael Brown, Botham Jean, Ahmaud Arbery, rest in peace George Floyd, rest in peace Tamir Rice. Staying quiet's not an option when you find it hard to breathe. Complacency does nothing, it just keeps us in dis-ease. Let it burn, let it burn, let it burn. burn. Cause you can't keep your comfort while claiming to be down for a change. We've got to admit rage too has a place. So help us turn the spark into a flame. Watch us turn the spark into a flame. Help us now and get out of the way. It's our turn to let it burn. Let it burn, let it burn, let it burn. This was true. 
can be a place where new growth happens. Burning it down can actually be energizing and sometimes can lead us to finding our voices. We constantly reinvent throughout life. As the Greek philosopher said, change is the only constant in this life. And we all find our voices at different times. We all have more or less power at different times and in different places. It is a privilege to reinvent. It is a privilege to have the opportunity to enjoy a long life, changing and growing. The final performers show us just this, reminding us that time is not a guarantee and has much to teach us. Welcome to Cheryl Lescombe and Chucky Zare. Cheryl is a singer, songwriter, and storyteller who has been part of the Canadian music scene for over 45 years. Born in Kitchener and raised in what is known as Waterloo's Veterans Green Community, right across where Laurier is today. Cheryl introduces us to some of her life experiences through music, showing us the power of voice and storytelling, and showing us how this has served as a strategy for survival, for resistance, and for love. Cheryl performs songs from her most recent album, Well Played. And Cheryl is accompanied by Chucky Zare on keyboards. And Chucky Zare is a classically trained and talented multi-instrumental singer-songwriter who has been performing in this region for over 40 years. Chucky has received awards for her songwriting and acted in, co-written, and scored several books. Welcome, Cheryl and Chucky. Thank you. 
join me in thanking Cheryl and Chucky. I don't know about you, but I am feeling lit up, warm. My flame has been ignited. I'm feeling heated, the heat that motivates you to act. And I feel bright. I feel lighter. I'd like to tell you a short story. A few years ago, I found myself staying in a tree house in Los Angeles. And while I was there, I crawled up the ladder to get into bed. And right at that moment, I reached over and I grabbed a book without even seeing what it was. I grabbed a book and I opened it to a random page. And all this page said was, how can you use your voice if you don't find it? I was astonished. I took a picture of the page and I keep it with me to this day, reminding me that 
It is essential that we both find our voices and then use them. There is no one way to find your voice and there's not one way to use it. Today I'm asking you, how can you find yours? And how can you use it?